mic is yours. Oh, so I'm to move that, yeah. So cool. Brilliant. Thanks, Divya. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Leonie Watson, and I think it's safe to say I've just unlocked the Joshua Davis is a tough act to follow badge. Um, <laughs> Uh, I work as a digital accessibility consultant for an agency called Nomensa, working out of the UK. And I also blog at tink.co.uk, and that's the website I'd like to use today to talk around some ideas about accessibility. But trust me, accessibility isn't as bad as you probably think it's going to be. Accessibility is one of the tools that we bring together into a toolkit known as inclusive design. It's there with usability, with the technologies that we use, the designs that we put together, and collectively those things come together to create really great user experiences. Inclusive because they include many different strands of the skills that we all use in our daily jobs, but inclusive also because it's about thinking about including many different people in the target audiences for the things that we create uh, you know, in the projects that we work on. I don't know about you though, but accessibility, inclusive design, they're perfectly good phrases, they describe what we do, the accurate reflections of, of uh, things that we carry out, but they don't really rock my world. They're not what sets my heartbeat racing, they're not what gets me out of bed in the morning. A phrase that does do all of those things for me is the idea of designing like you give a damn. Like we give a damn about creating energetic, exciting, innovative uh, projects. Like we give a damn about creating things that are elegant, beautiful, superbly functional. Like we give a damn about the people, all of the people who are going to use those things that we spend time creating and building. So today I'd like to introduce four principles of designing like you give a damn, and in doing so, uh, offer some thoughts around the concepts of accessibility. So my first principle is design like your Banksy. Uh, understand the, uh, the rules and the lessons, Ooh, sorry. Uh, but don't be afraid to challenge the accepted wisdom. And by that I mean that it's important to understand the fundamentals of accessibility and inclusive design. But once you've got that knowledge and you can make informed decisions, there's no harm at all in challenging some of the preconceptions that exist around it and seeing if we can come up with something new. One of those preconceptions that's very much in existence is that accessibility kills creativity. Uh, it really doesn't. Uh, an organization that I work with back in the UK once said that they thought accessibility was a challenge to creativity. Several years later, now they get accessibility and it's part of their processes. They acknowledge that it's not a challenge to creativity, but it is actually a creative challenge. And that's very much, for me, the right way to think about it. Um, I'd like to show you now a quick screencast of a project that two of the guys I work with at Nomensa uh, have put together. Uh, it's just a web form, but with a little bit of CSS magic. They've turned it into something highly accessible, but just a little bit more engaging. crime to cut that off in its prime listening to a bit of Pink Floyd at this time of the morning is never a bad thing. But uh, you know, that's just one example of how accessibility can really come together. And that web form is keyboard accessible, it's screen reader accessible, um, it's easy to use. So all of those things come together and I hope in an example that kind of shows accessibility and creativity actually can live side by side quite happily. Another uh, misconception is that accessibility is difficult. I'd like to say it really clearly. There is no magic ingredient to accessibility. Uh, rocket science is difficult. Brain surgery is difficult. So creating a DeLorean that's a time machine, that's really difficult. To a lot of people, doing what we do every day and building websites is pretty damn difficult. Um, but accessibility isn't. It's not difficult. It's just unfamiliar territory for a lot of us. When we think about designing and building stuff, we can relate to the other devices that people use, tablets, smartphones, desktops, ultrabooks, whatever. 
it's a little bit more difficult for us to relate to someone who has a disability, someone like me who can't see, someone who has a hearing impairment, mobility impairment, or cognitive difficulty. But that's just unfamiliarity, and the only thing that keeps it unfamiliar is the way we think about it. So uh, accessibility in many senses is just about understanding something more about the different people that are in your target audience. And uh, if you've learned to create and build websites, you've learned HTML, CSS, uh, PHP, Perl, JavaScript, whatever your technology is, uh, trust me, you really can get the hang of accessibility too. So another principle, design like your Da Vinci. Uh, Look around, never stop questioning, be curious about the ways that you can improve the stuff that you're doing pretty much every day. So think about when you're prototyping, you're building up the, uh, the first ideas, the wireframes for your projects. Think about where you position things, simple stuff, but make sure that where you put your logo, it's always in the same place on every page. Same with widgets like search, navigation. You guys all know that that's pretty much good for usability for all of us, but for example, if you're partially sighted, have low vision, and you're using a screen magnifier, uh, these things become really important as orientation landmarks. Um, time for you when you get home maybe to go back to uh, some of your childhood activities. You ever play pirates? Go home, get a uh, piece of cardboard tube and stick it up to your eye like it's a telescope and take a look at the world around you. Suddenly what you'll find is that you've got a really limited viewport, and that's not a million miles away from using a screen magnifier on a computer. It takes a very small portion of the screen and blows it up many, many times. But it means that you've got a very restricted view, very restricted understanding of the page or the app that you're looking at. And so things being in the same place consistently laid out uh, make it much easier to navigate and orient yourself within a page. If you know that the logo is always going to be in the top left corner, you can kind of hang your navigation and your movement around the page off that piece of information. When you're thinking about functionality, the same thing applies. If you're going to put a widget on your website and use it repeatedly in different places, try to make sure that it behaves in the same way no matter where it appears. Learning curve is not something any of us want to go through when we are learning to use websites. And there's always a little bit of a learning curve when you come to a new site. But for someone, say, with a cognitive difficulty or a memory-related problem, it's even harder to, to understand how functionality works and to become adept at using it. A quick note as well about any widgets that have got forms in, make sure that they're clearly labeled. Um, and by that, just put a visible text label in place so that someone who uses a screen reader who's visually impaired can understand what information needs to go into the form. By all means, use an HTML5 placeholder, but always try and double it up with a label as well. The reason being is that once the placeholder text has been overwritten, there's no visible clue left to uh, explain what it is you should be doing with that particular form field. <coughs> Also, try thinking about different ways to get at stuff. Again, this is probably stuff that you're already doing in your designs and, and the stuff that you're building, but look at different ways of navigating. In this case, this particular prototype has category navigation. It also has tags navigation. It might have a search as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but it might also have a site map if it's a big site. The simple reason being is that people who have disabilities, pretty much like the rest of us, have different ways of getting at stuff, different preferred uh, ways of exploring information. And take this through to your design phase. So when you're uh, designing your uh, website or your app, think about the content. Uh, give it a good text size. Make it easy for people to read, especially if you've got a site where getting at your information is really important. You don't want to make have people fight for getting at your information. And that, again, transcends itself up into if you have partial sight or a reading difficulty, having a comfortable text size with good color contrast is just going to make it even easier. And that's something you'll find a lot about accessibility. It's actually just usability or good user experience under a magnifying glasses. The things are not separate by any stretch of the imagination. Think about uh, heading structure and the structure of information on your page. Um, headings, as I'll show you a bit later in this talk, are incredibly important to screen reader users, um, but they're also helpful visually in terms of uh, identifying information and structure on a page that can help all sorts of people uh, consume your information much more easily. Um, and again, think about uh, navigation, uh, the way it looks, the way it feels, the way it behaves. Something else you can try is just uh, kicking aside your mouse for a little while and uh, try tabbing through a page that you're working on and see how easy it is to know where your keyboard focus is. All browsers have uh, a native style sheet that includes uh, a focus outline for focusable elements as you uh, move through them on the page, but a lot of designers and developers will take that out. 
And that's a complete disaster if you happen not to be using a mouse and be entirely stuck using a keyboard. Uh, so give it a try on, on a website that you have responsibility for and, and see how easy it is to navigate just using the keyboard and know where you're on a page. Particularly, try finding a page that's got a lot of form fields on it and then focusing on one of them, if there's no visual indicator, there's no way to tell which form field you're on and therefore what bit of information you're supposed to be entering. So thinking about how people get at stuff is, is really important. And then as you move it through into building, uh, think about your HTML structure, really, back to basics. Um, HTML itself has a lot of really good accessibility stuff in it. I've heard a few people say recently that the web isn't broken, it's only the stuff that we do to it that kind of makes it that way. And that's a fairly good point. Uh, all the tags that we use every day, paragraphs, tables, headings, lists, um, they're all really good for accessibility because uh, assistive technologies, particularly screen readers, rely almost exclusively on the HTML code uh, in order to provide information to the user about the type of content that they're coming up against. Um, and then as you think about your CSS layer, your visual layout, um, you know, move things around to create a, a visual layout that makes the most sense uh, for that audience. Screen readers, for example, will follow the source order, um, but as you'll well know, uh, that doesn't necessarily uh, have to mean that the same visual order is applied. One thing just to keep in the back of your minds is that if you're a sighted keyboard only user, uh, the visual flow through the page still needs to make sense. So there needs to be some relationship between the underlying HTML code and the visual uh, formatting of the page. Um, and then lastly, of course, you get your, uh, your website, your app, whatever, up and running. Um, try out a few of these things. Um, try and put yourselves in the shoes of some of your target audience for a little while. There's a great free open source screen reader for Windows called NVDA. Uh, if you go to nvda-project.org, um, download it, have a go. Try abandoning your mouse for a couple of days and see how you get on, or even just play around with the stuff that you build. Um, boot up your screen magnifier. Um, you know, most platforms these days, Windows, Mac, Linux, um, all have these tools freely available. Just have a go and, and see what the experience is like. <clears throat> Uh, the fourth, third principle is designing like your Chanel. And by that I mean strive for beauty and elegance, but understand that these things um, may not be the same for everybody. And this is a really kind of key concept of accessibility. Don't stop designing and building stuff that you want to go out and design and build, but just bear in mind that when you do those things, you might need to build in a few different ways and different approaches for people to be able to use them comfortably. So I'd like to now just uh, to illustrate this a little bit more, kind of talk to you about uh, accessibility and technology, HTML5, ARIA, um, and in particular how uh, assistive technologies like screen readers kind of come into play. There's uh, an accessibility stack at work. Uh, at the bottom level, you've got the browser, its rendering engine, um, and it obviously will bring in support for uh, HTML, HTML5, whatever the specification is. Sitting on top of that, you've got the browser's accessibility API. Just because a browser supports a particular feature of a language doesn't necessarily mean it's going to make that same information available through its accessibility API. If you want a really good resource for kind of finding out a bit more about the relationship between the two in different current browsers, check out html5accessibility.com, uh, which has information uh, just along those lines. On top of the accessibility API, you've got the screen readers and other assistive technologies. So when it comes to the user experience for a blind or partially sighted person, you've got three key variables coming into play. The browser's got to support something. It's got to make that information available through its accessibility API. And then the screen reader itself has got to pick up and make use of that information. Of course, uh, no two browsers are the same, no two accessibility APIs are the same, and you can sure as hell bet that no two screen readers are the same. Uh, there's an added uh, catch in that a lot of screen readers, particularly on the Windows platform, use uh, a technique known as the virtual buffer. So when the page loads in a browser, it takes a copy of the page, and it's actually that version of the page that the user interacts with. And uh, a little bit more about that will come clear uh, in just a second. So back in the day, and I'm talking maybe 10 years ago, um, screen readers were pretty limited beasts. And when you came to a web page as a user or uh, any other document, uh, your pretty much only means of exploring it top to bottom uh, was in a linear show, but like a laundry list. The Tic Tac Web Live. Link home takes logo a silhouetted trilby hat. Same page link, skip the main menu. 29 January 2013, archive for the web life category, JAWS scripts for the HTML5 main element. 
posted on November 17, 2012 in Web Life. The main element extension specifies a way to mark up the primary content area of a web page in HTML5. There are several good reasons for introducing the main... You still awake out there? It's no surprise, perhaps, that really this is why um, a lot of people think that if you use a screen reader, um, it takes you twice as long, maybe even longer, to, to get around a web page. And this is pretty much why. Um, it was like dealing with a notepad, a text file. Um, you had no other means other than just to read it top to bottom to find out what was on the page. Good news is, is that things have changed. Uh, and this is where it comes back to this idea of a virtual buffer. Amongst other things, what that enables a screen reader to do is make a whole bunch of shortcut keys available to the user. So, uh, for example, uh, JAWS, the screen reader, if you want to move between headings, you just press the H key. Uh, lists, tables, paragraphs, pretty much any HTML element you can think of, there are shortcut keys applied. And that applies right the way across all the different screen readers that are available out there. And that means you don't have to read everything top to bottom. Archive for the web life category, heading level one. JAWS scripts for the HTML5 main element, heading level two. Accessible forms with ARIA live regions, heading level two. Using the HTML5 placeholder attribute, heading level two. So in one go, you can just bounce through from heading to heading on the page and uh, wait till you get to the one that maybe sounds like it's of interest before you actually then drill down into the content uh, in a more linear fashion. You might have noticed the different heading levels being announced there as well, and this comes back to uh, the earlier thing I mentioned about headings being particularly important to screen readers and getting that logical hierarchy. It's because it helps us build up a mental map of how information is structured on a page. So that heading level one at the top of the page, fine, it's pretty clear that's the top of the content area, the main uh, heading for the page. And then below that, there's a whole bunch of other headings or sections of content that have pretty much the same level of importance in, in the kind of information structure. So uh, again, really simple HTML basics, but incredibly powerful and useful uh, for certain people. Uh, another example of using this uh, non-linear uh, movement through a page is uh, using lists, for example. List of two items, list of three items, list of eight items, list of 21 items, list of 12 items. So again, there with lists, um, it's helping you build up meta information, if you like, about the information that you're coming up against. Uh, we know there's a group of items coming up. We know that they're related in some way because they're grouped in a list. And we've got a number, so it gives us a, a rough understanding of, of the size of the, uh, the entity that we're about to start navigating through. It's also you know, fairly uh, easy logic that if you come across a list of items uh, once on a page, um, it's, there's a fairly even chance it's going to be, say, navigation. But there's still a big gap missing between uh, the experience of being a sighted person and browsing through a page and uh, using a screen reader. Happily, HTML5, or at least uh, ARIA and HTML5, uh, come to the rescue. ARIA landmark roles were a big stride forward in kind of helping fill in some of the gaps in this sort of information and exploration. Uh, the HTML5 sectioning elements, uh, header, footer, aside, article, section, and so forth, um, also carry through this uh, same functionality. Banner, article, 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 navigation region, search, content information, and suddenly what we've got through using another shortcut in the uh, screen reader's arsenal is the ability to bounce through a page from one HTML5 sectioning element to another, but at the same time not only move to a section of the page, but to understand something about its purpose. And suddenly um, we've got something that's much more equivalent to the process of casually taking a glance at the page and going, okay, header at the top, footer at the bottom, search over there, column over there, content in the middle, uh, and bang, suddenly you've got a holistic view of a web page. And, and that's made a huge difference in terms of accessibility, uh, and of course, uh, those of you already moving towards HTML5, already using it, uh, these are probably things that you're already using in your code already. So it's just an easy accessibility hit. One thing about those is there were several uh, article elements on that page, several nav elements, um, and it would be nice if there was a way to distinguish one from the other. Um, we screen reader users just keep wanting more, right? Uh, what you can do is you can add in some ARIA, uh, ARIA label or ARIA labeled by, depending on whether the uh, existing text is visible on screen. And if you team that up with these sectioning elements, what you can do is provide even more information about those things. So for example. Navigation, more posts. Navigation, categories. So now as I'm moving through this particular page, uh, you know, with my screen reader's shortcut key, I've got even more information available about the different sections that I'm in, and it increasingly empowers me to be able to move quickly and easily and effectively through a web page, which is really brilliant. Uh, a new uh, element that's kind of recently uh, come into the 5.1 spec is the main element. Uh, I think it's fair to say there's been a fair amount of discussion about it, certainly in the accessibility world. Uh, it uh, introduces... Uh, 
what some people have referred to as the missing sectioning element that just encompasses the entire main content area of a web page. Uh, it's useful because it uh, effectively provides an element where a lot of people have been using IDs of main or main content or something similar, so good for styling and, uh, uh, and focus for scripting. Uh, from an accessibility point of view, uh, it has this particular benefit. Main region. That's it. What it does is it makes it possible for, uh, in one kind of keystroke, to move directly to the top of the content area. For the most part, that's the bit of the page most people usually want to get to first. Designers amongst you, developers amongst you, may well have included skip links in the stuff that you've built. Um, they're fine, they do the trick, the same thing. They're a link that you can use just to move straight to the top of the content area. But you know what, they, never, they always feel a bit like a dirty hack to me for one reason or another. They either take up real estate on the screen where most of your audience probably doesn't want to know about it, doesn't really care. So we went through a phase of hiding them off screen, um, but then of course that's okay if you're a screen reader user, but it's no good at all if you're a keyboard only sighted user. So now we've moved them back on screen and we make them visible on focus, but yeah, you know, it's all a bit messy. With the main element, what is possible is that the browsers, the screen readers can just implement native uh, shortcut keys uh, that will just implement the same functionality. And as designers and developers in time, we'll just be able to bin uh, skip links all together, which I think would be a really positive step forward. Uh, dynamic updates are another uh, interesting challenge for screen reader users on the web at the moment. Uh, you've probably all built stuff that has this uh, you know, Ajax call where you uh, do something on the page and another area gets updated. From screen reader user's point of view, um, it's a little bit trickier. Tequila makes me happy. Add tequila to basket button. It does. <laughs> um, the problem there is that once the button's hit and the basket summary has been updated, screen readers, like people, can't actually be in two places at once. So there's a problem. You're either focused on the button because you need to activate it, or you need to be focused on the area where the information has changed. Uh, if you just add in an ARIA live region around the basket summary, set the uh, ARIA atomic property to true so that the entire content of the live region is updated every time, it becomes a completely different experience. Tequila makes me happy. Add tequila to basket button. Basket summary. Your basket contains one items. And so without actually moving the screen reader's focus from the button, um, that information about the basket summary being updated is uh, made available to me as well. So a kind of another example, I suppose, of where there's no reason in accessibility to lose the functionality that you want to build into stuff. It's just adding it or refining it to make sure that it works in different ways for different audiences. Uh, the last design principle is design like your Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Um, know that planning is important, but uh, know that ideas and curiosity can really make things extraordinary. Uh, waterfall is still a very prevalent uh, methodology in the kind of software design and, and web design, um, and accessibility fits very easily into it. You've got natural progression of key stage checks, whether you're prototyping your wireframes, your designs, template layer, integration, content loading, whatever it may be, uh, you've got several key points where it's ideal to just check in on your accessibility. It's worth doing it from the outset because stuff that you identify in your wireframes or your prototypes or your designs, you can fix really easily. If you wait until the end when everything's built, your content's loaded and your project manager's breathing down your neck to get it live next week, uh, you're in for a world of pain in terms of getting stuff fixed for accessibility. So, uh, you know, test often, uh, fix little and spend less is, is kind of a really good way of looking at accessibility here. Accessibility also fits really easily into uh, more agile environments um, and just taking a completely different approach really. Uh, much more light touches through your kind of sprints uh, is really helpful. Uh, if you've got an accessibility go-to person in your team, they're absolutely worth their weight in gold. Uh, pair them up with your developers. Uh, this has two benefits. It A means that through the course of a sprint, you can just make some quick, rapid iterations that improve the accessibility. But it also means that you can start to embed a legacy of knowledge in your team or within your colleagues. Uh, that basically means eventually accessibility just becomes second nature. Uh, and at that point, you know, we can do away with the whole concept of accessibility uh, at all, uh, because it's just something that we'll all be doing. The really important thing is knowing that uh, no matter how much planning you put into things, uh, it is the ideas and the innovation that really makes things extraordinary. And that's what comes back, for me at least, to the idea of designing like you give a damn. It's important to know all this stuff. It's important to put yourself into uh, different people's shoes and try and understand something of their experiences. But 
we all take pride in the things that we build. Uh, we put time, we put effort, we put energy into them. Um, as Joshua said, we like to play around with stuff. So um, please, if you do one thing today from this conference, go away from here today and when you next pick up a project, whether it's uh, for work or play or either or as it may be, um, please go out there and do it like you design, like you give a damn. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, uh, it's a nice talk. Um, I have a question related to the font size being uh, fixed pixels versus mm -hmm. relative numbers. Uh, does it have any relevance to accessibility? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it's still a good idea to, to, to build flexibility into your font sizes. Um, actually, sorry, could you say something without the microphone so I can see where you are? <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. So um, my question is like uh, limited visibility for limited visibility people who want to have a zoom font. Mm -hmm. Having fixed pixels isn't that a problem for accessibility? Uh, no, not for not for people using zoom, but um, it can be for people using kind of old texture size. Uh, for example, so uh, where possible, it, it's still a good idea to build in that flexibility if you can. Um, uh, not so much of a problem as it used to be, but but still a good idea. I have one more question. Uh, in our pages, we used to have lots of Ajax. Uh -huh. uh, so it's always a tough thing to do accessibility for Ajax related stuff, mm -hmm. especially when things are built in the JavaScript. So do you have any suggestions or references that we, we should check? Uh, sure. Uh, firstly, keep using Ajax, um, but think about um, keyboard accessibility. So just run through it. Um, make sure that uh, you know if you're building particularly kind of sort of widgets that, that call in scripting and stuff. Just make sure that uh, you know uh, if it looks like a button, walks like a button. Um, make sure you can hit it like a button, whether you're using a keyboard or a mouse or, or any other technology. Um, Screen readers, going back two or three years, um, did have trouble because of that virtual buffer I was talking about in terms of updating that copy of the page that sat in the buffer um, when an Ajax call was made. Uh, these days, um, I'm not aware of any recent screen readers that have problems with that, but uh, bear in mind if, if you have people in your target audience, which may well be the case using older technologies, um, that can be a problem. There are a couple of hacks you can use in terms of using on focus to kind of force a virtual buffer refresh, but uh, um, you know, by and large, you, you're pretty much okay to, to use most Ajax stuff these days, but just check it like everything else for the kind of basics of accessibility. Thank you. Sorry. Hi. I'm <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, first off, I want to say thank you very much. Your, your presentation is fantastic and, and <laughs> was you. one of the primary reasons that I, I actually came to this conference. <laughs> Um, I'm a new accessibility. Uh, I'm, I'm new to the field or new to the uh, the concept. And in the past couple of months, I've kind of started to uh, to go back through projects that I've worked on in the past and try and bring them up to speed. Mm -hmm. So my question is this: If looking at a existing projects that are already in place, if you had to uh, to say these are the top couple of things that you should nail right off the bat mm -hmm. uh, to fix some of the biggest downfalls that that some of our uh, our users experience. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend we 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 kind of attack first? A um, couple of things. I'd make sure that that that. Uh, focus outline indicator is, is present and really visible um, because that's a real showstopper for, for sighted keyboard only users. Um, speaking with a certain degree of self interest, um, check your text descriptions, your alt, alt attributes on your images to make sure that uh, you know, everything is well described and, and helps convey graphical information to, to partially sighted and blind people. Um, and then take a look at your, your HTML structure, um, you know, make sure you know, if, if something looks like a heading, it's marked up as a heading and, and the structure is there. Uh, make sure link text is, is clear and helpful. Um, if you spot any on your page about, you know, read here, click here for more type links, um, exterminate them with extreme prejudice would be my advice. Um, links are like signposts. There's no point in having a signpost on a road that says it's over there. <laughs> you kind of need something a little bit more robust than that. So give people an indication of what they're going to get when they, uh, they follow that link through. So if you could nail those, that would be a really good start. That's perfect. Thank you very much. Welcome. Hey, Tink. Uh, so um, this isn't a question so much as a request. Uh, 
I, a lot of people here have never used a screen reader, or never seen somebody use a screen reader, or heard somebody use a screen reader. Would you just give us a short sample of you walking through a menu to see the kind of speed that you're actually reading at? Uh, yeah, hang on, let me um, swap things over, so. Can you understand that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hang on, I'll slow it down. Um, no, yeah. no, no, I want, I want them to hear it like. Really? This yeah. is it, okay. So uh, let me see if I just. Menu, search box edit. Tab, document, sub menu, D. So I, the one thing you'll find is that with screen readers is we don't stop and listen to every word, every syllable of something that we use. We're no more patient than, than anyone else. Um, so you learn paths to stuff you want to get to. So. Document, sub menu, D. Application, open, oh, enter, leaving menus, Windows Explorer, items, new, multi-select, so list box, not selected, box, alien effects. Kind of moving through stuff. Um, right. I don't know if we want to. So I guess my point was. Menu, search box, edit. Sorry. You'd like to hear that, you'd like to be able to navigate a web page in the same way. So having good links, having good descriptive things as short and sweet is probably a good idea as mm, well. Absolutely. Um, there's kind of a balancing act. Um, if the information isn't there, you've got no choice, you don't get it. Um, but equally, you don't want the information that's there to be too verbose, too long-winded. Um, you know, like most people, we want to get into a website, do what we've got to do, and, and get out again. Um, so, so yeah, there is a balance. Uh, provide you know, a degree of information that's helpful, um, but, but don't feel you've got to kind of write war and peace on the subject. Hi. Um, I've been working on accessibility for quite some time, and, but I'm mainly focused on working on accessibility with voiceover and browsers on the Mac. Mm -hmm. and one thing that I have found is that uh, testing cross-browser support for accessibility is a really hard thing mm -hmm. because you have to learn how to use a different screen reader, etc. Is there any resource where I can find stuff like uh, where is this area property supported, in which browser, and which screen reader supports it? Not at the moment, but if you can hang on until the end of next week, <laughs> um, the htmlfaccessibility.com website I mentioned before, I'm giving a presentation with Steve Faulkner, who's the, uh, the curator of that website, next week at CSUN. Um, and through the course of that, we've done some research into the uh, screen reader support for um, HTML5, anyway, um, attributes and elements, uh, and we'll be uploading that somewhere um, public within the next week or so. Um, if we can ex extend that out to ARIA, we certainly will. Um, there's been some conversations actually here about the, uh, the Test Forward platform and uh, uh, looking at kind of ARIA compatibility as well there. So um, hopefully there'll be some stuff kind of coming together soon, but right now, unfortunately, I'm not aware of anything that, um, that really does the trick. Thank you. Um, great talk, thank you. Thanks. Um, uh, speaking as a designer, I'm, one, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if the first person, this is the first person's same question. Um, if you're designing for uh, size, uh, um, text size, mm -hmm. is it better to use pixels or M's? M's. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Or at least um, set, set, a base, set a base font in pixels, that's fine. Just be aware of the, the problem. I think Internet Explorer still has trouble um, with flexibility of pixels. I don't think any other browsers do anymore. Uh, you're asking the one person in tech size is probably the wrong, <laughs> the wrong person to ask. But um, I think it's okay setting a, a, a base size in, uh, in pixels, but then uh, just, just conditioning so, it for different so browsers the, and the making person, it flexible after that. The person that. doesn't have to remember. The, the base number of, of pixels. Yeah, just so that the people using older browsers where it's still more about text resize rather than zoom, um, you know, still have the ability to, to change the text size if they need to. Uh, and unfortunately, we know um, all too well that there are you know, lots of people out there still using um, browsers that we really, really wish they weren't anymore. OK, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm wondering if you could say anything about the state of accessibility on mobile, on tablets and handsets? Uh, it's really good, actually. Um, really good from the point of view that, that pretty much all mobile platforms now have some kind of um, integrated assistive technology, at least as far as uh, blind and partially sighted people are concerned. Most have uh, a screen reader of some description or a screen magnifier or both. So from the consumer's point of view, it's, it's a really good option. Um, in terms of apps, um, Again, a lot of the, the platform vendors, Apple, Microsoft, uh, Google, have done some really good stuff so that if you use the native toolkits for, for development with the SDK, there's a lot of really good accessibility available in there already. So um, if you build stuff out of their default controls, uh, you know, you're halfway through the battle. 
um, in terms of web on, on the mobile. Uh, the rules change a little bit, um, but uh, you, you still need to sort of think about uh, similar things. The chances are that if you're a keyboard only user on the desktop, uh, you'll probably have a Bluetooth keyboard plugged into your touchscreen device. Um, it's worth being aware that on um, touchscreen devices, if you're using a screen reader, the gesture set changes. So um, on my iPhone with voiceover turned on, um, I double tap to activate something instead of single tap it, flick left and right to move between elements uh, and sort of focus on different things on the page. So, um, but yeah, generally speaking, mobiles, you know, it's, it's a really good option um, for accessibility for a whole bunch of reasons. So uh, from a design point of view, from a web point of view, do you have to do anything different with your website to make it accessible on touch? Um, yes. Uh, bear in mind that it's um, source order is really important uh, on a mobile website. Um, just for that whole thing, you know, if you're using a screen reader and you have to flick left or right to move backwards or forwards between items. Um, the thing I really, really hate is um, making a choice, going through to a page, working my way down through a whole list of other bits and pieces and then having to scrim all the way back up to the top to kind of execute the action. Um, that gets to be really hard work. Um, so yeah, thinking about kind of source order a little bit more. Color contrast um, uh, has a slightly different connotation on mobile. Um, we use them outside, we use them in lots of different environments. So um, you know, really making sure that that color contrast is there and really good and clear. Zoom, of course, is a lot easier on mobile, so um, that's pretty good. But um, but don't uh, don't disable uh, Zoom, um, you know, when you uh, use your kind of viewport settings in your CSS. So uh, it's a user scale, I think. Um, you know, don't disable that um, because uh, if you do, then it, it kind of uh, abandons the Zoom capability that a lot of people rely on. Thank you. Hello, my question is um, to the HTML5 and the accessibility support for, for screen readers. Um, you had some examples where you showed drawers using the main <coughs> tag and article tag and so on, uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, my experience was with that screen readers do not catch up fast enough with um, new, yeah, new features and web specifications. Um, was it a demo version? Was it just um, did you fake it in your presentation? <laughs> or? No, no. Jaws has um, Jaws has supported Aria landmark roles for the past three versions. For um, Aria, yes, but uh, uh, HTML uh, as of I believe the current version 14. Um, uh, there's mixed support for HTML5 elements right across all uh, screen readers at the moment. So uh, VoiceOver, for example, I think only supports the header element, but nothing else. Window Eyes as a screen reader on Windows doesn't support any of them, but it's the only one not to support any of the, um, the, the, the sectioning elements. Uh, NVDA and JAWS both actually have a really good coverage between them, um, and, and each of them supports, uh, I think, out of the, the, the six that are in the 5.0 spec, uh, I think each of them supports at least three of them at the moment, uh, although not the same three. So yes, you are right, there is a bit of a lag um, in terms of accessibility, uh, or at least assistive technology is catching up, um, but that gap is, is nowhere near as big um, as it used to be, um, because you know, for ages, I think the web sort of sat there with HTML4, a bit of XHTML, whatever, and, and the screen readers didn't have to sort of really worry about kind of keeping pace. Um, you know, a lot of their users now, along with the rest of us working and playing on the web, um, really want to get into this new technology, the stuff that's exciting and, and innovative, and, and I think they've recognized that um, they need to start moving on that a lot more quickly. Um, JAWS, actually, in a couple of cases, has moved too quickly, so for the ARIA Live regions, it actually in, um, implemented support for uh, the assert, uh, not the assertive, what was it, the rude? Uh, attribute value for the ARIA Live regions that basically meant no matter what your screen reader was doing, it would interrupt you with the update come hell or high water. Um, thankfully, that got abandoned out of the ARIA spec, uh, but, uh, but one version of JAWS still supports it, so uh, they're almost edging to the point where uh, they're perhaps jumping the gun a little too much sometimes. Thank you. <laughs> um, cool. um, thank you all. If you have more questions, um, contact Leonie or John Folio afterwards. So, first of all, thanks a lot, Leonie. Thanks. Mm -hmm.